Okay, I'm gonna give you a disclaimer up front. I haven't done this in a few weeks. Um, I did a little testifying in, in Africa, but um, I haven't been in this type of a setting, so I'm nervous. Yeah. And, oh yeah, thank you. And I'm trying to um, figure it out. You know how when you, you wanna get a pulse on something and you wanna make sure you're not just giving a sermon, you wanna give a message. And to prepare for a message is a little, little bit more laboring. And because um, you have to realize who is it for. Um, the word can be for anyone and for everyone at different times, but a message is when somebody says, I need a message, I need a word from the Lord. And that's what pulls on the, um, the, the spirit and pulls on the speaker to make sure that he or she is speaking from um, the oracles of God or the letters of God and not the oracles of, of man. Our subject this morning is one that always intrigued me in, in its thought in Genesis 21, and a particular reading of text is going to be in verse 14 to 19, um, and New Living Translation will make it a little bit brighter um, as, you look, as you look at the context of it. But, so I was studying and preparing for it, I kept just wondering and pondering over um, the narratives within the story, and we'll go through a little bit of it and we'll see how it unfolds and preferably how it relates to us. Um, even in this, this now moment. Um, look at somebody say, Lord, open my eyes, Lord, open my eyes. To, see what you have to see what you have prepared. Now you can, you can miss it. You can miss it because you're not focused or spiritually blind or just you have obscured vision and it's right around you. It's so close, you're about to bump into it. But when God opens your eyes to see what he has prepared, and prepared is made ready, made ready. Um, some of you have wonderful cooks in your home. And the strangest thing is that sometimes they're cooking something for the next day, but it's lighting up the whole house. And you go downstairs and say, well, is this for tonight? No, this for the, and it's, no. Preparing this for a few days, you know, especially if you take, and I'm sorry, I'm country, if you take a, a ham hock and boil it down and, and, and simmer some black eyed peas and they begin to look at each other and say, we're going to get together and pretty soon the black eyed, oh, I'm sorry, I'm talking country food. The black eyed peas jump in with the ham hock and it, it simmers and you can't put it in the crock pot. It's not this good, a different taste, but it begins to cook slow. And then you, you look up and you, you smell some crackling cornbread. I lost all of y'all now. Dude. And that cornbread get the, in, a, in a dark, dark skillet. It goes in the oven, it sits there. And, but the sad part is she, she comes and says, well, this is for Sunday. I truly believe prophetically that God has prepared something for you for now. And you can smell it in the atmosphere and sense it like it's a new dish that's coming your way. Raise your hand and say, Lord, open my eyes that I may see what you have prepared for me. And no, I do not know how to cook. So Abraham got up, verse 14 of Genesis 21 and verse 14 to 19, New Living Translation. So Abraham got up early the next morning, prepared food and a container of water, and strapped them on Hagar's shoulder. Then he sent her away with her, their son, and she wandered aimlessly in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water was gone, she put the boy in the shade of a bush. Then she went and sat down by herself about a football field, a hundred yards away. I don't want to watch the boy die, she said as she burst into tears. But God heard the boy crying. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven, Hagar, what's wrong? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Go to him and comfort him. For I will make a great nation from his descendants. And God opened Hagar's eyes and she saw a well full of water. 
she quickly filled her water container and gave the boy a drink. Lord, open my eyes to see what you have prepared or made ready, already made for me. Beautiful story, but we cannot enter into it this lesson unless we portray or we catch hold to the background of the story. You cannot approach the story of Hagar without, uh, which her name means flight, without realizing the hard taskmaster that sin will be in your life. Sin carries its own punishment and guilt. It's a hard road to travel. And no one is exempt or can say that they have not sinned. But God's mercy and love is faithful to forgive us and to restore and renew us. When we repent and turn our hearts back to God, we find his faithfulness and forgiveness. I don't know, but I'll be the first to raise my hand to say I thank God for his forgiveness. And, and I thank God for his mercy. And I don't know how much you use this week, but this mama said, keep living. You'll use it sooner or later. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 8 through 9, it says in the New Living Translation, New Testament, 1 John, he says, if we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful, God, and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness, unrighteousness, wrong living, and wrongdoing. I think you missed a part in this New Living Translation that I was reading. And in the second part of the verse, if we confess our sins to him, hmm, he is faithful and just to forgive us. This is not going down to the, to the little church and sitting in one box and somebody sitting in another box and say, when was your last confession? <laughs> or confessing to someone that's your bestie and you want them to understand you, but they cannot forgive you. If you're going to confess, you better confess to the real judge, which is God. And he is faithful and just to forgive us. Sin, 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 sin is missing the mark or not coming up to the standard of God or his requirements for us to live a holy and separate life of righteousness. Let me put a disclaimer in my little message this morning since I got this opening part right here. For you that say, I never talk about sin. I never preach on sin. Well, get in on sin this morning. Here it comes. <laughs> You see, we all miss the mark, and our righteousness is not our own righteousness, it's God's righteousness. Our heart's desire is to do right by the Lord and to live right for him. Paul helps us with this desire in Romans 7, 24 and 25, New Living Translations. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is demanding, that is demanded, I'm sorry, that is dominated by sin and death? I thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ. Somebody said the answer is in Jesus. He can free you from your own misery of sin and death. So I see it now in this way. With my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of sin, the nature, I am a slave to sin. But Paul doesn't stop there in Romans 7 chapter, verse 24, 25. He moves you on to the eighth chapter and begins to describe the law of the spirit. The law and the spirit in Christ Jesus made me free from the law of sin and death. Raise your right hand and say, I got some Holy Ghost power. Some things I just ain't going to do. I'm struggling, but I ain't going to do that. Everybody didn't say that. That's all right. You pray for us. Not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but the righteousness, which is of God by faith in Christ Jesus. God here in this story had already revealed to Sarah that she was going to have a child. Even in her old age of 90, Abraham, 100, but strong. But yet Sarah knew she had erred when she jumped up and told Hagar, the Egyptian, yes, that woman. to go and connect with Abraham to bring forth the promise. See that God told her that Herr, Sarah, and Abraham, you're going to do this. Hagar was never acknowledged as Abraham's wife, but she was one of the concubines or the mistress. 
back in that day, it was allotted so. In this house of Abraham while he was on his journey, therefore she was in a lower estate as a mistress than to be the wife. As soon as this illicit situation began to break out, it's a bizarre of a setup. Sarah here now becomes very upset with Hagar and Hagar despised her mistress. You know how it could be, ladies. Y'all can talk when you're not talking. A slide it <clears throat> sounds real loud. And we just oblivious, like, what's wrong? You didn't see that? I see what? The way she coughed. I said, maybe she needed water. No, uh. -uh. She didn't need no water. I know what that meant. She just coughed. Why she got to keep rubbing her head? I don't know. Maybe she, maybe she, I don't know. Maybe it's too tight. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Hagar knew that she was going to have this child, so she despised her mistress. This caused Sarah to become indignant and angry and rage. Abraham, oblivious, walking through the house, not knowing what's going on, but he's caught in the middle of it. Ooh. Because Sarah begins to accuse him, you're assisting her in all this insolence that she's doing in this house. Sarah has developed now this temper of scornfulness against Hagar. Hagar was treating her in a bad way, so she began to treat her in a bad way. You can imagine the atmosphere within that house. The domestic harmony had gone. Sarah had adopted this, this, this idea of the, I don't like her, she got to get her out of here. I'm unhappy, I'm unhappy about her any way you can look at it. She took flight when she began to see before she had Isaac, Ishmael, um, Hagar took flight because she felt that things were getting tight in the house. And here's the part of the lesson in the 16th chapter of Genesis, verse 3 through 9, that boggles me in this Sunday school lesson, that she got out and she had ran away because she felt the tension was in the house was too strong. She took flight, exercising the right of her name, meaning flight. And as she ran, the Bible says that the angel of the Lord came and told her, go back. Now, wait a minute. Some of y'all got, got out, you better put on your second pair of track shoes and keep running. But if the angel told her to go back and submit to Sarah, that's what she had to do. She goes back, now 18 years pass by. Unbearable domestic dishonor and disharmony, violence within the house. No love lost, the relationship became more strained day by day. Hagar and her son Ishmael were expelled now. In the 21st chapter in verse 13, Sarah said, I've had enough. Told Abraham, I'm demanding you to put her out. Get rid of her. Lord, open my eyes so I can see what you have prepared. Put her out, Abram. I don't want her around her any longer. Send her away. What do you do when others put you out? When they send you away or dismiss you, I submit to you this morning, you pray and watch God make a move on your behalf. Their rejection is normally God's acceptance. He's getting ready to open your eyes for you to see what he has prepared. I gotta go over that slow just a little bit so you can keep up with me. I got out of the situation, but you told me to go back. Now I'm here again some 18 years later and it got worse before it got better. And now the man that I had the baby with, he's putting me out. How is this working for my good? <laughs> Watch God in the middle of the madness bring about something beautiful. He's getting ready to open your eyes to see what he has prepared. The record of this expulsion of Hagar and Ishmael, although sorrowful and touching, it had to happen. He sent her away. Genesis 21, verse 14. Put your eyes on the text. So Abraham got up early the next morning, prepared food and a container of water, strapped it on the Hagar's shoulder. Then he sent her away with her son, and she wandered in aimlessly in the wilderness of Beersheba. Ladies, come on. Abraham wasn't broke. 
But he was so despondent where he said, all I got time to do is look, just get this bottle, take this food and get up out here because I can't have all this noise going on in this house. Sound very, very brutal, but Abraham wanted some peace. I need five brothers to say, I want some peace in my house. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. So whatever I got to do to get peace in this house, I got to get it done. Strapped that bottle of water on her, gave her a little food and said, you, you get on the bottle, you, you got to go. Hmm. What, a, what, a, what, a, what a, uh, a position to be put in. Abraham could have done better than that. Could have sent at least five or six servants with her to let them, y'all watch her, make sure she get to where she's going, look out for her. No, I want her to wander aimlessly in the wilderness. But isn't it a blessing that he didn't drop her in any wilderness? He dropped her in the wilderness of Beersheba. Beersheba, we'll come to that in a moment. Wonderful place. If you're gonna drop me, drop me over here. Rich as he was, but he couldn't do any more for her, overwhelmed with the madness in his home. Not thinking about the sad condition that she would be in, her and his son, and the lack of time they had to plan to go through what they were going to go through. But I want to submit to somebody through here that when you don't have a plan, God has a plan. When you don't know what to do, God knows what to do. When you're down to nothing, God is up. Yeah, yeah, you've been around me long enough to know that. God has an all-seeing eye watching out every move, and he's planning the next move. Raise your right hand and say, God's planning my next move, Pastor. It's going to be cool. Now here they are in the wilderness again. She's been here before. Somebody said she's been here before. And God is yet still watching over her. Ishmael, Isaac, Abraham's son, begins to taunt Isaac and said, you know, you, I was here first before you, but you were not the birthright. You did not come right. I know you were here. I was here. You were here before me, Ishmael, but I'm Isaac saying I'm the promised seed. The heart of the mother was moved, wondering what's going to happen to her child. Wandering in this aimless wilderness of a place called Beersheba. It's called the well, the well of the sevenfold oath. Seven promises. I'm in the right place, but I got to get my eyes open so I can see what God has prepared. Touch your neighbor, say, you're in the mountaintop. So you're in the right place. I need God to open your eyes. You can see what he prepared before you came off the parking lot, before you walked in the room, before you set your quiet self down, before you wouldn't open your mouth. I dare you to throw your head back and shout glory. God always identifies the loudest cry like a mother in Albertsons or Smith. Kids gone wow. But she can hear that cry. Come on, mothers, talk to me. She can hear that cry. I heard my boy. No, what, all these kids hollering, but I heard my child. For the mother to have that type of, in, in, uh, that type of connectivity, it comes from the umbilical cord. It's cut but never severed, my definition. But she can feel that child in trouble and go to the school before the teacher calls, say, what's going on down here? Because my baby's in trouble. Aimlessly wandering in this place of promise, oath of promise. Using the water sparingly from the wineskin container or bottle. Hoping to discover a well, she's wandering. I told you she's been here before. Genesis 16, I'll just go over that quickly in the verse 11 through 14. The first time she fled from the house of Abraham. She ran to a place, and this is what the angel told her to go back. And at this place, she found a place of a well where God that sees her, now she sees him. Hagar finds an experience with God and have a reoccurring experience. But this time, he opens her eyes to see more than she's ever seen before. She comes back, and she reminds us of this place of Ber, Ber Lamara. Here is the solemn promise of God in Genesis 16. It speaks of 2 Corinthians 1 and 20. The solemn promises of God for all the promises of God in Christ Jesus are yes and amen to the glory of God. They are fulfilled in Jesus Christ and they are yes, or which means they are amen and it's already done. 
all the promises are there, but I need to open my eyes to see why don't I have more of the promises that's already been promised. I have a few of them that gives me history with God that he's able to provide, but I know he has more for me and more for you, but I got to open my understanding to what God has for me. The person next to you is no better than you. They got 24 hours in the day like you, but you have to open your eyes and know, God, I can handle more and I want more. Not out of greed, not out of need, but out of promise. If you promise to give it to me. I want everything God promised me. Amen. Today I believe God is cooking something up. I smell it in the spiritual kitchens. I'm sorry. It's going to be good. It's going to be wonderful. Cooking something up wonderful. Genesis 21, 15. Then Hagar and Ishmael traveled, moving. I'm paraphrasing Genesis 21, 15. Traveling, moving forward. Somebody say moving forward. Going through this place of unknown, looking for the next move of God. Aimlessly moving through a wilderness of Bershia. Here they were, this well of seven promises. And guess what happened? Genesis 21, 15. The water ran out. Down. Y'all know how we get when there ain't no water. It can be everything else to drink, but it's something about water. I just want some plain old water. I don't want no, no sweet tea. I don't want no, no lemonade. I don't want nothing in it. I just want some good. Go on, say it. It's just a, just a refreshing thought of it. Just to know that I can get some water. The water's running out. The boy is in the shade. She sits over 100 yards away from him. He says, I don't want to see this child die. And she begins to burst into tears. What do you do when your resources run out? Here's where you got to get tight with me. What you don't do is you don't give up. What was meant to sustain you has come to an end. You have to turn your attention back to God and realize he's the one that provided. He's the one that have made way. I got to remember that what I had was not my source. My source is in Jesus. He is my all providing sufficient one. Remember, I'm on assignment. I'm traveling to my place of blessings and I'm getting ready to break through and break out on every side. Whenever you're on assignment with God, he's watching your every step. The eyes of the Lord are on those who are moving through this world to make yourself strong on his behalf. Remember this also, God heard your child crying and he's seen your tears. Don't be too proud to not show, I don't know what to do, Lord. I'm crying and I'm hurting, but I know you're watching out for me. The angel told Hagar before, go back to where God has told you to come, where you came from. But the angel now begins to speak to her and say, Hagar, what's wrong? I want to talk to you that's been flighting and running away from God. What's wrong with you? God has too much invested in you for you to be scared and start running. Just wait and have your eyes open and be prepared for what God is preparing for you. Hagar, what's wrong? Don't be afraid. Don't operate out of fear that God can't do it. I heard your boy crying, and I seen you lay him over there. I want you to go now and comfort him. Isn't it strange how God tells you to comfort somebody when you're hurting yourself? You in between blessings, but God tell you, go testify and overcome by your testimony and the blood of the lamb. Don't come in church and just sit down like it always been that way. Come in and greet a few people. God bless you. How was your week? Amen. God's been faithful. We're still here. It ain't all perfect, but God's working some things out. Who have you comfort late? Woo! Prayer is a key here. 
it often becomes great at extremities. That God opens eyes and you see abundance that's near at hand. Lord, open our eyes this morning we may see. Like the eyes of Elisha in Jeremiah 5, when he says he was a man like us with human tendencies. But he prayed and it did not rain. He prayed again and it did rain. Open our eyes like Elisha in 2 Kings 6 and 17. He prayed, Lord, open thy servant eyes that he might see that be more with us than are against us. Hagar prayed from a place of despair, prayed from a place of blindness in her eyes, and God began to open her eyes and she saw a well of water that was already prepared. Like so many today, it's mind-boggling that people can be all around you and you're saying, look at God, he's about to make another move. And they say, what, 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 what? You can't see God up to something? What, what, what? But get your lenses right. Focus back in. All this cray, cray, cray going on in the world, God's got to bless his people. Somebody got to be in place to be a distribution center for the world. When everybody's going down, the church is coming. Blind, blind, blind. I blind, blind, blind. They begin to cry out to God and the well became visible. Look how generous God is. Miraculous he does things. Miraculous. The miracle was not in creating a well for Hagar that she had to dig. The miracle was this, people of God, that the well was already there. The miracle is that God already opened her eyes. The miracle is that God already, he opened her eyes. You're digging for something, God said, oh, you're in the wrong place. I already prepared your next move. I've already made way for your next abundance. Why are you striving and laboring and wasting energy when something I've already prepared? Why don't you praise me like this? Oh, I've already prepared it. Shout a bump fist, one person said, and he will make a way of escape. That's why I'm standing here. That's why I'm sitting here. That's why I'm smiling. Because God prepared a way. Come on, church. It's not your safety belt or your doing. God, come on, I need five people to say, God got me through that one. I, I thought for sure the devil would take me out on that one. But God made a way. I'm almost done. I told you to pray for me. <laughs> she had this thing of this container. I want you to catch this. The container was empty, but she didn't throw it away. Aimlessly walking around, food's gone, but I still got my container. I may look silly to you, but I believe God's going to fill this up in just a, what you got that for? Don't worry. My container represents my faith. My container represents my capacity to hold more. You told me to get rid of it. I said, no, God's got to fill this back up. Whatever you prepare for, God will provide. When you get that thing set before God, he's a full fountain before an empty vessel. Whatever you do, don't get rid of your container. God's about to do it again and again and again in a wilderness. I'm going to do it for you. Ah, oh, Clinton, get off of it. Pray God, open your eyes. Pray God, give you more than you've ever expected. Look at the end of this madness. The serious mistakes that were done. Sarah, who took matters into her own hands and gave Hagar to Abram. Abram went, went along with the plan. Guess he had to. When the circumstances got bad, he acted like he had not any, don't, don't want to have anything to do with it. Hagar ran away from the problem. But in spite of the mess of the situation, Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that all things work, work together. What? You did 
just told me that he had his mistress. You just told me that she was put out. You just told me that she had a baby that wasn't. You just told me that Ishmael Isaac came later. You just told me out of all of this madness, yes, all things work together for the good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose. There is a sure promise here. No matter what your problem is, no matter how jacked up it looks, no matter how bad it looks, no matter how ratchet your life is, I challenge you, bring it to Jesus. Watch him change your story into his story. Watch him change your story into his story. Watch him change your story into Come on, give God praise in this place. I decree this morning that the angel of the Lord will see your tears. I decree this morning that the angel of the Lord will hear your child's cry. I decree this morning you will not be afraid. I decree this morning God is sending you a word of comfort, a word of encouragement, and a word of strength. I decree this morning God will open your eyes to see a well of water in the wilderness. Can I say that again? God is going to open your eyes to see a well of water in the wilderness. This has already been prepared. God knew you were coming to Las Vegas. He knew things would get rough. He knew you were trying to get back right with him. He knew demons were chasing you, but God had already prepared. If you just get to where I told you to be, I'll bless you right in that wilderness. Someone say, God knows and he cares. God told me to tell somebody this morning. He knew you were coming this way. He knew you had ran out of what you had. He knew your resources have already gotten low. He knew you got to the end. But at your end is God's beginning. He understood you couldn't do it, but he's about to fill it back up. So I decree this morning, get on back down to Jesus, the fountain of living water, and draw out everything you need. If you need healing, go get it. Need a miracle? Go get it. Need a breakthrough? Go get it. Need your joy back? Go get it. What's wrong with your bucket? Come on, dip. Whatever you need, go back and get it. God's never running out. You have found a well that will never run dry. They gave up on you. They wrote you off wondering where to go next. God's already prepared to bless your life to the endless blessings. You will never lack again. You will never want again. You will always be blessed. Blessed coming in. Blessed going out. Blessed when you're sitting. Blessed when you're standing. I prophesy refreshing waters is about to hit your life. Come on, God. Open my shake somebody's hand and tell them my next business is going to be bigger than this business. You're with the right person. Prophesy to the other person. They might not be having a business. But tell them my next move is going to be bigger than this move. Why did you ask them? How do you know that? Tell them God has already prepared it. Don't lose your hope of expectation. It might look silly. It's been 10 years. You've been talking about what God's going to do, but I'm holding on to my container. (laughs) 
Raise your hands. Say, Father, I decree. I will see it before I see it. Because it's already done. They dropped me in Beersheba, a place of seven wells. There's no way I'm going to miss stumbling upon. I said that real fast, didn't I? <laughs> stumbling upon something refreshing, even in the wilderness of Las Vegas. Listen, E Church, get this word. Lock in on this word. Woo! Can I prophesy? Push your name and say, move over. Move over. I need room. I need more room for what God's getting ready to do. It's going to blow your mind. In the midst of the madness. He works the best. Open my eyes. I can see what you have prepared. for your grace the book of Revelations the third chapter they bought they obtained and they gathered things of their own strength but he told them in the third chapter the book of Revelations I I asked of you to buy of me gold buy of me clothing and I asked of you to ask me to anoint your eyes with eye salve, salve eye sap eye sap I'm sorry and that anointing of ISAB gives clarity of God type of vision. Wouldn't it be, or it will be amazing when the scales fall from your eyes and God says, I had so much more for you, but you were too nearsighted. But lift up your eyes and look out on an endless horizon and ask me, is there anything too hard for me? There's nothing too hard for me. When those scales fall, only thing you're going to be, as most of us have been, has been as we've grown in life, disappointed in the sense, I wish I would have saw it sooner. I would have walked in it even greater. And God's going to do that for someone this morning. I believe it with all my heart. He's already prepared it. I want, if nothing else in the lesson, I want you to remember, he's already prepared it. Say, he's already prepared it. Look at somebody say, I'm going from a bottle to a well. Mm -mm -mm. I'm going <laughs> from a little bit to abundance. Let me put this in the prophetic atmosphere too. I said, wow, she kept that container. I call it a bottle, wine skin. And Dr. Francis, you have to keep going back to the well. I said, Lord, why did you just, just give her running water? He said, no. I want her to know where it came from. Sometimes God does not overbless you, so you keep coming back to the source. And the more you can handle more of that source, he'll bring you, still got to come back to him. 
because he is the source of all that we need. Who's here this morning? They want to give your life to Jesus Christ before I give to the pulpit coordinator. Pastor House, I need to give my life to Jesus Christ. I've been aimlessly moving through my own wilderness and now God is bringing me closer to him. And I want to make a conscious commitment this morning that Jesus Christ, I want you in my life. Before the ministers move or before anyone else move, before you leave me, just let me pray over you where you're standing or at this altar, but move, come now, raise your hand or come to this altar and say, pray for me today that I will continue to seek the Lord. He will continue to be the Lord of my life. Where are you? Who are you? Come down. That's right. Move. You're the one. Move, 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 move. Come on. Come on. Come on. I'm going to pray as soon as you get here. Come on. I got to get back to the Lord. There's no other source that's going to help me but him. Just come quickly. Come quickly. They're coming. Come quickly. Bring your friends. Bring your loved ones. Walk quickly. Let me pray over you. Ministers, when I, ministers, when I finish praying, if they like, get the information from them. But if you're coming, come on. Come on. Come on, come on, come quickly, come quickly, come quickly, come quickly. Come quickly, come quickly. Come quickly, come quickly, come quickly, come on, come on, come on, come on. God bless you, sir. Oh, that's uh, uh, my good friend. Open the hearts, open the eyes. Yeah, I don't remember, Joe. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you, I want to see you, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. See you high and lifted up. Shine in the light of your glory. Your glory. See you high and lifted up. As we cry, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Let's pray, Father. We bless you now for these that are at this altar and that are today that standing in the room that are opening their hearts to you this morning for them to see you in a new way. We're not new believers. We are strong believers. Walking in faith that you've given us from the very start. I'm in this wilderness, but I'm in a place of seven oaths, seven promises. Let me walk right into a wealthy place of healing, financial liberty, breakthrough and independence. I am not a charity case. I am a distribution center. I am a blessed to be a blessing. This is the last time my hand will be handed out, but I will be giving out because this is my well. This is what you promised me, that I can come here and draw and I can water others in the name of Jesus. Father, I love you. I love you. I know I do. I'm not your perfect child, but I am your child. I'm the one that keeps coming back to you because you're the source of all I have. And I thank you today for life. I thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. Let it rest on my life in the name of Jesus. If you're at this altar, put your hand on your heart and say, Lord, hear my heart cry. I open my heart up to you this morning. Say, Lord Jesus, I open my heart to you. Heal my heart. Heal the brokenness. Let there be joy in loving my spirit again. In the name of Jesus, thank you. You are the mender of broken hearts. Come on, give God a clap and a shout in this house. Wow. Wow.